we are very happy to to receive David Tarton from South, Southampton, and he will talk about string worksheet models of black hole microstates. Okay, thank you very much, and thanks to the organizers for putting together this nice conference and for the invitation. It's been a pleasure to be here, and uh, I've very much enjoyed it so far. So this talk is not going to be about string field theory. It's going to be about a related topic uh, of string world sheet physics applied to black hole microstates. And uh, before I start, let me mention my collaborators, Imo Martinek, Stefano Masai, and my PhD student, Davide Bufalini, who will be applying for postdocs this fall, Sergio Iguri, and Nico Kavensky, who's a former postdoc at Southampton, now at SETI. Okay, so some broad motivation to start with. So I said I was gonna talk about black hole physics and I think it's fair to say we live in very exciting times in uh, black holes with all the experimental data that we've had in the last six, seven years. We now have about 90 signals of binary mergers from LIGO Virgo and now Tegra. And we've had this iconic first image of the near horizon region of a black hole in a galaxy far, far away. And so I think it's fair to say the time is ripe to further the exploration of the internal microstructure of black holes. And we'll do that in string theory, and we'll be building on a lot of progress that's been made in the last several years in describing black hole microstates, particular pure states of black holes, using smooth horizonless supergravity solutions. And when I say smooth, I mean smooth up to physical sources. In string theory, this could include brain sources, string sources, or um, orbifold singularities, for instance. If we do this in ADS, then these can be studied using holography. And these solutions are holographically dual to heavy, pure CFD states. And I'll show you some examples of that. And they're interpreted as a pure black hole microstate. So we, we have various options for the asymptotics, but if we take an ADS3 limit, we have solutions which are asymptotically ADS3 going over into a near horizon throat of a large black hole, which involves an ADS2 factor. And deep inside, if we have a smooth solution, it'll end in some smooth cap with some possible sources. And these black hole microstate geometries provide examples of string theoretic quantum structure on the scale of the black hole event horizon. However, I said I was going to do string theory, not just supergravity. And it won't surprise you to know that there are features of black hole microstates in their space-time description in the bulk that require us to go beyond the supergravity sector. And these features include the fine microstructure of the bound state. So this might be a supergravity solution that is ending smoothly. Uh, in some geometry, but if you use a string theory description, you might be able to see a much finer structure of the underlying brains that make up the bound state that this describes its back reaction. So we have fine microstructure and we can probe this with the spectrum and dynamics of both fundamental strings and D brains. And these microstate geometries, as well as their stringy counterparts, are interpreted in the context of the broader Fosbol proposal that quantum effects are important on the scale of the horizon of black holes due to the finite size of the underlying bound state of strings and brains and such that Hawking radiation is unitary. And if this could be established in general, this would resolve the black hole information paradox. So that was just a very first broad brushstroke motivation. The plan of the talk is that I'll have a little bit more intro and review of some older work. And then I'll introduce a set of world sheet models for black hole microstates before describing some recent work on heavy light correlators from these world sheet models. And then uh, if time allows, I'll sketch some slightly less recent work on D-brain probes and general gauge models. Okay, so to warm up uh, some review of some old things that- uh, Sorry, question. question. Yeah. yeah, so in the just uh, broad question, when you say there is structure at the scale of the horizon, so I know that there are some of these microstate or the, or the smooth horizonless geometries only have horizons that are stringy size. Mm -hmm. Do you, are there also examples of 
a horizonless solutions where the horizon would have been a macroscopic size? Yes. So you're, you're one slide ahead. So we'll, we'll get to that in just a moment. Yeah. Yeah, good. So, um, so the question was about small string scale black holes versus large black holes. So let's warm up with a simple example of a small black hole, which is the one where we have most control. So we start with the two charged black hole in string theory. And to begin with, we can just consider a fundamental string wrapped around a compact direction, carrying a large winding charge and also a large momentum charge along that direction. This is a system which has an exponential degeneracy of microscopic states, and this goes back to the work of Sen in the mid 90s. If you give this string, so that there are various ways that the string can carry this momentum, if you give it a classical traveling wave uh, such that you can uh, resolve its back reaction with supergravity, then uh, this configuration sources a smooth horizon, a, a horizonless supergravity solution, which is smooth up to the physical F1 source at the location of the string. And these classical profiles and their back reaction are coherent states in the Fox space of the string. As I said, there are no horizons as a string source, but as you know, the fundamental string has only transverse vibrations. So it has to occupy some finite size in the remaining non-compact direction. And this is the basic mechanism by which this system, when you explore the black hole regime, is not a point like bound state, it occupies necessarily a finite size. Now that finite size is still string scale in this example, so this is a small black hole. Uh, but the advantage of this black hole is that you can understand all of the entropy, uh, you know, you can get the, an understanding of the back reaction of generic states in the Hilbert space from the study of these back reactive solutions. By using e duality, we can map. Uh, just, uh, yeah. Yeah. But if you increase enough uh, the size of uh, the level of the string, the size should grow uh, at least something with a square root of n. So if n is big enough, this <laughs> it is not anymore. <laughs> A, a small black hole. In, yeah. So uh, very good. So what happens is that the black hole, these black holes, can be large compared to the Planck scale, and that's why it's you know at least in in a string theory context, it's valid to call it a black hole for me. But uh, when you study the back reaction, you find that also the uh, you know the, the string scale is related to the Planck scale with similar constants. So what you find is that the horizon of this Black hole is always string scale in, in the full 10 dimension. And uh, so the, there's a match of exactly the correct physics. So as you increase the number of uh, you know, n, the number of winding or momentum, also the corresponding black hole horizon increases compared to the Planck scale, but it's, already, it's always string scale. Good, so this is sort of the gold standard of, of understanding uh, a black hole from all its microstates in, in string theory in the bulk. And if you estimate the size of these bound states, you find exactly the horizon scale. So using dualities, we can map this to a, a bound state of NS5 brains and fundamental strings, or a bound state of D1 and D5 brains. And when we study these configurations in that duality frame, we find smooth solutions in supergravity. So these brain charges are dissolved in flux in the supergravity description. So that's a nice thing, and it, admit, it means you can use lots of powerful supergravity technology to study these bound states. And in these duality frames, we can also study precision holography, ABS3, CO22 holography. Any more questions about the small black hole? Actually, I have a very naive question. So technically, what you're doing to count this exponential degeneracy is you fix the n and the w in the L0 and L0 bar expression, mm -hmm. and then you're just exciting the oscillator modes and counting how many those are, yeah. fixing the mass level. Mm -hmm. OK, thanks. Yeah. yeah, so then the degeneracy is e to the square root of the product. Of the right, and somehow that doesn't work if you just had momentum without winding. There is no exponential then. If you have momentum without winding, that's just a one charge system. Yes, yeah, so that's just a finite 
um, number of states. Okay. Uh, yeah, so this is the simplest system, uh, as far as I know, uh, which has this de exponential degeneracy of states to be interpreted as a black hole. Okay, good. So uh, I threw in one extra slide after some nice discussions in the last few days. Uh, asking the question, you know, in general, one can ask what can the world sheet tell us about the back reaction of these heavy down states? So there's some work which feels like a long time ago I did in my graduate school days, uh, which connects to work that people in the audience did uh, even earlier, about using open closed disk amplitudes where you can set up a bound state of, of in this case, D1 and D5 brains, and you can compute the amplitude for the emission of a supergravity particle from this disk. And to do so, you need boundary condition changing insertions on the boundary of the disk. And if you glue a massless propagator, you can use these amplitudes to derive the asymptotic expansion of the supergravity field sourced by these bound states. So this will be a two charge bound state, but what we did also was to add a wave along these frames to add the third charge of momentum. And when you add a third charge, that's when we get to the appropriate charges for a large DPS black hole, so D1, D5, D in this case. So this is not the subject of the talk, but it's just a side remark uh, that this is one where you can get insights on the bound states from perturbative transition. And these disk amplitudes provided important input into the supergravity program at the time, because we showed that a larger set of supergravity fields were necessarily sourced by these three charge bound states than were under active consideration at the time by the supergravity program. And if we think about configurations uh, invariant on some compact D4, this is an extra tensor multiplet in 6D uh, supergravity. However, that approach only gives us access to the asymptotic region very far from the bound states. So it can give us some hint to what supergravity fields are turned on with what kind of combinations, but to actually access the region near the brains, we either have to use the supergravity field equations to somehow integrate that information inside, which is what people did. And if we want to access the stringy microstructure, we need a different approach. And that's the topic of today's talk. So I'm going to work with three charge bound states in the NS5 F1P duality frame with backgrounds that have pure NS and S flux. And I'll be using RNS formalism with BRSD quantization. And the broad set of questions I'm interested in is that, okay, as I've said, string theory contains modern supergravity. And we are interested in asking to what extent the physics of strings and brains is necessary to describe the internal structure of black holes. And on general grounds, you might say, why not? Why should everything be in supergravity? Uh, but more concretely, microstate geometries contain topological cycles at the bottom of these throats. And brains can wrap those cycles. And a priori, they're massive states, but as you increase the length of the throat, these become lighter and lighter and lighter. And these are candidates for some of the most entropic degrees of freedom of near extremal black holes. And these brains are known as W brains. So concretely, I'll be working in type 2B, compactified on a Calabria 2, so T4 or K3, which won't play much of a role. That'll be a spectator in the game. And also one more circle, which will be macroscopic uh, throughout. And its radius will be parameterized by Ry. That's an important modulus, which I'll, uh, I'll deal with throughout. And I'll wrap, so this is a standard NS5F1P system for black holes. The five brains are wrapped on all the compact directions. The F1s are wrapped on this preferred S1, and we have NP units of momentum along S1. And the, if we have some geometrical back reaction of these bound states, the geometry has charges proportional to the integer numbers of one of five brains, uh, according to the, the various moduli. And we'll be working in a regime where we have low curvature supergravity, and also in which we have a near brain ADS3 region. So concretely, that means I'm taking numbers of brains and, and, and charges to be large, but finite, so I have large finite N5, so that my uh, Q5, which controls part of the geometry, is large compared to the string scale. 
I also have large N1, in, in, and this is asymptotically large in the sense that the number of F1 uh, strings dissolved in the background is like one over GS squared to compete with the GS squared in the numerator so that Q1 is finite. Uh, and we'll work in this supergravity regime with large Ry so as to have this ADS3. And in practice, that means we have a double hierarchy of the scales in the back reaction. Okay, so geometrically, what this gives us is we started with brains in flat space, we back react them. The initial sort of throat which develops is the NS5 brain, linear dilaton throat. But because I have this additional charge and I have large Ry, I have in the IR an ADS3 times S3 times P4 throat. That's a question. So effectively, effectively uh, the five brain throat is in 10 dimension, but the ADS throat is on the uh, NS5 uh, work volume in a certain sense. No, here in this cartoon, I'm drawing uh, a 10 dimensional space time. So uh, you, if I were to fill in all these, uh, so this is a little bit schematically, but this is ADS3 times S3 times T4 which really arises in the IR, just deep inside this five brain throat. And so, okay, so how to think about this? There are, there is this S1 direction, which is a, a circle which is large uh, at infinity. And then there are also the angular directions of uh, not these directions, but the, the, you know, I can factor further than this. And then I have four plus one Minkowski space asymptotically. So there's an S3, which is the radial direction of that four spatial direction. So what happens in, uh, in this very set of limits is outside the S3 is growing as, as the radius increases. And uh, by the time you got to ADS3, the S3 has become finite. So it's ADS3 times S3 with uh, some stabilized uh, S3 direction. But in ADS, the S1 has changed character. So out here we had uh, finite size S1, but in ADS, the S1 has become the angular direction of ADS3. Okay, so the, the two compact, uh, you know, the angular directions play different roles according to whether they're growing or shrinking. So in the linear dilaton, both are stabilized. So I have the, S, the S3 is fixed size and also the S1. So you should think that, you know, the, the S1 is some combination of these S1 and S3. There's a locus which is going to shrink smoothly to cap the space time off smoothly. And then the circle will grow as the angular direction of ADS3 until it stabilizes at finite size all the way to infinity. So it's all just one big space time, but it has sort of regions of definite character um, as you go through. And we, one can isolate those definite character regions by taking various decoupling limits. So the string theory I'm going to describe for you is in the NS5 brain decoupling limit. This is where I've taken a scaling limit in supergravity to push what was the old asymptotics out to infinity. I've zoomed in. This is usual kind of decoupling limits, Alamandasena, but firstly, I can isolate the five brain throat and have a description of perturbative strings in this region. And this is going to be the, the region in which I'll work for most of the talk. But then we can also take a further. ADS3 decoupling limit, and towards the end of the talk, we'll be working purely in this ADS3 limit. That has the advantage of being able to exploit ADS3 CFT2 holographic duality. So, so you, you probably know, so here you can also postulate some holography, but the dual holographic theory will be the little string theory that lives on the NS5 brains, and relatively little is known about that. And it's quite poorly understood. Compared to ADS3 CFT2, where we have lots of uh, machinery we can use. I feel like Ted has a question. He's either burning into me, but no, he's just paying very close uh, attention. Okay, good. So what is the holographic CFT2? Well, this was uh, introduced nicely in Pranavesh Maiti's talk yesterday. So I don't need to give too much introduction, but just to remind ourselves uh, the field content. So, so this CFT2 has a moduli space and at some particular point in moduli space, it's conjectured that it's realized either symmetric product or the Borg CFT. And so for the complex space being T4, this is a symmetric product of N copies of T4, where capital N is the product of little n1 and little n5, the numbers of NS5 brains and fundamental strings. 
And this T4 sigma model is C equals six, and we have a symmetric overfold of any copy to it. On each copy, we have four bosons, four chiral fermions, and four antichiral fermions. And we also have twisted sectors where we can insert an operator which modifies the boundary conditions of these fields, just as was reviewed yesterday. So in the presence of one of these twist operators, one can think of the CFT, different copies of the CFT as having been linked together by, by these boundary conditions, such that the fields effectively live on a base space which is k times longer than the original one. Sometimes this is referred to as a strand of length k. We won't rely on this too much uh, in the talk. The one thing I'll introduce just for later convenience is that you can study uh, in the CFT single trace operators and uh, to the precision that we're interested in, we'll take a sufficiently simple one such that we can use the simple version of the dictionary that single trace operators correspond to supergravity single particles. So the particular one I'll use later in an example is a dimension half comma half chiral primary. So it's composed of just a fermion bilinear, one left moving fermion, one right moving fermion, just soak up all the T4 indices. And this gives us some particular chiral primary dual to some particular supergravity state. Sorry, so just to understand, these size are the super partners of the directions on the T4? Yeah. Okay. There's some slight subtlety that the the T4 here is not exactly the space time T4 because this can, can come considering the modular space of instantons of the. the right, this is the thing. boundary theory, and it's the T4 that's the target of but, the boundary theory. Yeah. To, so, so roughly speaking, this is the T4 which we compactified on. Uh, there's okay. some slight subtlety, but you know, at a cartoon level, you can think of these bosons as just the, those four bosonic target space directions of the SIG model, and these are the super partners. So the capital A index on the next slide is from one to four or? Uh, that, that actually happens to be a, an SU2 times SU2. So it's one of the, we, okay. we've decomposed the T4 vector index as, as SU2 times SU2, and that's a, a thinner. Uh, so it's actually plus or minus. So the, it just happens, uh, I've tried to suppress most of the technical details so to focus on the physics, but uh, good, since you asked, so these uh, two indices, one is an SU2 index in the space time, and the other is an SU2 in the torus. And so this uh, tells us that this operator has certain charges in the bulk that we'll be matching. So it has both uh, dimension and R charge. So this is the R charge, as is usual in holography, the R charge index corresponds to the compact direction, in this case, S3 uh, in the bulk. Very good. OK, so this is all we're going to need from the holographic CFT. Um, and uh, and this will be the operator we consider when we're studying correlators later. Okay, so the heavy backgrounds I'm going to be interested in in this talk are a particular family of black hole microstates which arise from uh, spectral flow, which is a, a general thing, but in this case the spectral flow refers to a supergravity spectral flow of a family of backgrounds known as circular supertubes. And I'll, I'll give some details later, but you can just think of these as some relatively uh, simple black hole microstates. And the family is labeled by a set of integers, which I'll uh, introduce. And the nice thing is that it gives us access to microstates of the small two-charged black hole in the simplest example, the large three-charged supersymmetric black hole, and also non-supersymmetric, non-extremal tree charge black hole. So it's, it sort of gives us access to all of these different types of, uh, of black hole. And the worldsheet description of these uh, backgrounds involves a particular gauged supersymmetric Western and a Witten model in which we start with 10 plus two dimensional auxiliary target space and we gauge two null directions, two null currents in the world shape, which reduce this 10 plus two model into the standard nine plus one super spin. Curiosity, if you write uh, the, the matrix of, of this uh, manifold, it, you get essentially the matrix of NS5 plus, uh, you, 
I mean, uh, in large, in the large charges limit, in large K limit, usually the metric you read uh, in the West Zumino is the metric of your space time. So I was wondering if you do this in your model, you get the metric of, uh, of NS5. Almost, yeah, you're, you're half a slide ahead. So just wait to the next slide and it'll be clear. It's not exactly the metric of NS5s, it's the metric of these super tubes. So it involves uh, NS5 with also F1 charge dissolved in flux and, and or momentum dissolved in flux. Sorry, just on, yeah. on the previous slide, these solutions that you get after spectral flow are still horizonless solutions. Yes. Yeah, yeah. But so what you're saying is they're horizonless solutions with the same charge and mass as that of a BPS black hole Correct. or non BPS. Or non BPS depending on the charges. Yeah, I see. Yeah, so so this this uh, spectral flow procedure. So if we switch off the spectral flow, we just have a microstate of the two charge black hole that we can say NS5 F1. You can also have NS5P. And these are typically been known as circular supertubes, just uh, as two charge solutions and then the spectral flow is a particular way of adding the third charge so as soon as we switch on spectral flow if we do it in a bps sense we get a three charge smooth horizon solution with possible orbifold singularities which is, has the same mass and charges as a bps large black hole and if we turn on all the spectral flows then we have those same words but with a non-bps black hole Technically, you can do the spectral flow because of you have a SL2 in the world <laughs> as a group. Well, one should distinguish between world sheet spectral flow and okay, we... space time spectral flow. So the spectral flow is a very general thing which involves mixing of U1s. Okay, so in the talk, there are different versions of spectral flow okay. which one can talk about. The spectral flow I'm talking about here, um, if you wait a few slides, I'll show you very explicitly. It's a mixing of angles of the S3 with the S1 that I've highlighted and also the time direction. And so it's a supergravity spectral flow, which involves describing how the S3 is twisted as the ADS3 times S3 is joined back into the asymptotic uh, space time. Can you repeat once more why you need three charges in order for this to work? So we can study both two and three charges, but the three charges is physically more interesting because the corresponding black hole is macroscopic compared to the spin scale. So what would be the three charges of the macroscopic black hole? NS5, F1, and momentum. Yeah. Yeah, yeah please. Yeah, I'm happy for it to be interactive. It's good. So uh, I miss, you said something about singularities in this previous solution? Yeah. So what what was so it? there are possible orbifold singularities. This depends on the integer parameters, uh, but they're of the type that we are perfectly happy with in string theory. Uh, so the okay, and so the number of things uh, that you get by taking the circular super tube and doing the spectral flow is some small number, right? Or yeah. So this is a, a very small. This is nowhere near the black hole entropy for the large black holes. Okay, but it's just a particular small class of microstates that we can yeah. study explicitly. And and how is this WZW model related to the WZW model that Pronobesh was talking about yesterday? Uh, is it the same or? Uh, it's related, but this is um, a little bit different because Pronobesh was talking about. Um, ADS3 holography applied in a very stringy regime and uh, also not considering trying to consider heavy states in the theory, but the vacuum of, of the theory for N5 equals one. But uh, having said those words, th the same, it's roughly speaking, it's the same kind of SL2, which describes an ADS3, uh, but we're gonna be using it very differently here because the SL2 I'll mostly talk about is defined in the model before I implement this null gauging procedure. And uh, so in my full space time, if I go back here, so the uh, ADS2 that Pranabesh was talking about is after taking this I see. limit, whereas my ADS2 is an ingredient in general into describing oh, a much yeah, longer space thanks. time. Yeah. Yeah. But after I take the limit, they'll be more closely related. Thanks for the questions. Okay, good. So 
Uh, I have this class of models. This was understood by uh, Emil and, and Stefano in 2017. And depending on how we embed these U1 currents into the target space in 10 plus two dimensions, we have a set of uh, parameters that describe that embedding and that gives us all these different backgrounds. And I'll describe some of those in a moment, but before we do, let me outline what you do in practice on the world sheet is you introduce these currents that you're gonna gauge and the associated world sheet gauge fields, which are chiral and independent. We have some asymmetric null gauging procedure. And then we integrate out the gauge fields on the sigma model. And then you can just read off the background fields of the resulting sigma. And depending on how we choose to embed the currents, you know, the choice of these uh, embedding parameters, which I'll show you in a moment, we can describe a variety of backgrounds. So I said we could describe both three and two charge, but actually the very simplest cases of one charge configuration where we take the stack of NS5 brains and we just separate them out onto their Coulomb branch in a circular configuration, which is symmetric in the sense that all these spacings are the same. So there's some ZN5 symmetry to this configuration. This circle around here is a contractible space time, uh, contractible circle in space time. And this Y direction here is the S1. So this is periodically identified here. And here. Okay, so this is just uh, a background with um, single NS5 brain charge. And we can add charge to this in various ways. So the super tube configuration is obtained by spinning this up in a kind of a barber pole configuration. So you should think that this configuration has some dynamics. It spins around on itself. And this introduces a uh, momentum charge along Y. So this gives us an NS5P configuration. And because this circle is periodically identified, each of these endpoints is identified with the following one. So the whole thing is a big spiral, which rotates as a helix. And then using T duality along Y, we can map this to NS5F1, which is still a two charge configuration. And then using the spectral flow, we generate the third charge, either in BPS or non-BPS fashion. Okay, so the psi is not one of the torus directions, right? It's one no, of this, is a, this is contractible circle in space time. It's one of the angles on the S tree. Okay, so more concretely, how do we choose uh, these embeddings? Well, we have two U1s and we're gonna embed them in some combination of the Cartan directions of the SL2 and the SU2, and also the uh, T and Y directions of this. So if I go back, so the target space was SL2 times SU2 times a second time direction, flat, and the flat extra circle uh, before gauging. And the T4 is a spectator, we can forget about it for most of the rest of the talk. But I have four coefficients according to how I embed each of these U1s uh, into the uh, model before gauging. They're not really four left and four right because we can actually, uh, if, you know, the, the overall coefficient is not physical, so we can set L1 and R1 to one, and the currents are constrained to be null, so we have two more conditions, uh, which we can think of solving for some one of these parameters, say L3. Okay, so then you can actually perform a general analysis and a priori these were continuous parameters, but they're subject to several constraints and it turns out they're quantized in various ways. Technically you can choose, and L, let's say this way, L1, L1 embedding, you have a J3 of SL2, J3 of SU. SU. The spectrum of SU is discrete, but the, the spectrum of SL is continuous. This is why you can uh, more or less uh, rescale things as you want. Uh, you mean the choice of this being L1 equals one and R1 equals one? Yeah. I mean, this, this is just providing that this parameter is non-zero. Yes, but I understand. But the point is that if both were SU2, you couldn't really play this game so freely because the spectrum would be discrete. It would depend on the details, yeah. So, so the, this analysis of spectrum uh, is sort of at the next step. So, so you could do something similar, but I would have to think about how it would turn out. But um, yeah, the, the main point is that you introduce these parameters, which in general are continuous uh, embeddings, but 
for consistency of the spectrum, they are quantized. And consistency of the spectrum includes uh, considering world sheet spectral flow along the gauge direction. There's a whole story there, but uh, let me not go into it until unless there are questions maybe at the end. But there is a nice fact that uh, there's a complementary analysis you can do in supergravity. And you can say, okay, what are the conditions in gravity for me to have a solution which doesn't have any closed time like curves and is smooth and doesn't have any horizons? And if you ask that question, the answer you get is exactly the same quantization conditions that the string world sheet wants. So that's a nice thing. So th for instance, there's a you know, this condition L3 equals R3 comes out of requiring no closed time like curves in the supergravity, and it's also uh, required for consistency of, of spectrum and, and so on. You get the various quantization. So th the, the details are not super important. The main thing is that you end up with a set of heavy backgrounds and a set of world sheet models, which are labeled by discrete parameters. And these integers are k, which is a positive, well, a non negative integer. Uh, Integers m and n, and the m and n describe the spectral flows. And in the space time and the supergravity, they correspond to angular momentum parameters because the spectral flow has an angular momentum. We have the number of one and five brains, and then this modulus Ry, which is, is the only continuous parameter left um, uh, aside from the other moduli. Good. So uh, this is a nice fact that we have this discrete set of backgrounds that we can. Uh, consider and we have an exact world sheet description of the string theory on those backgrounds. And okay, just for fun, I flashed the metric, but I'm not going to, you know, rely on any of these details. This was just to give some impression of what these solutions look like. So this is in partly answered to Igor's question. You know, you just read off the background fields. What is it? So what is it? Is these spectral flow solutions? And uh, probably the only thing to, worth highlighting here is, as I said. N and M describe angular momenta. So you can see them here in the uh, cross components between, let's say, time and some angle on the S3 parameterized by M. Same here, we have some time and another angle on the S3 parameterized by N. But then there's lots of other components so as to arrange smoothness. So, so, so this is a pure NS and S background. Yep. And the dilaton, is it uh, flowing? Is it constant? What is it doing physically so, in the. Uh, so the, the dilaton is attracted when you get as far as the ADS3 to, um, so, so you can see here, it, it does have some profile labeled by these, uh, these things okay. here. Okay, so, so delta is just a combination here, but uh, see, uh, sigma naught has some radial dependence. So, so since uh, square root is some radial thing. So it, it depends on the, charges you choose what exactly the dilaton is doing because um, if you if you switch off uh, the F1 charge then you have NS5P something slightly different happen but uh, yeah you have, uh, you have this thing I guess so. I'm just asking is there a point where it's it's is it everywhere weakly coupled or is it getting strongly coupled somewhere ah, good. Uh, no so we don't have any strong coupling physics because we've separated the NS5 brains apart so there's uh, if we had coincident NS5 brains, then a throat can develop near them and you have a strong coupling region inside the throat of multiple NS5 brains. But we've avoided that problem by splitting the NS5s uh, onto their Coulomb branch. And so there's never more than one NS5 sitting in any particular location. So we don't have a uh, strong coupling region where we lose control. So yeah, the dilaton is, is stays finite, but has some profile. So, so you have some, dis some delta functions in your sources for the... No, no. Not, not generically. So it depends. So again, it depends on the charges. So if uh, if I go to NS5P or just pure NS5, then I'll, I'll have an NS5 source explicitly visible. If uh, I have both NS5 and F1 switched on simultaneously, then the supergravity solution doesn't see the locations of the NS5 brains. They appear to be fully dissolved in flux and everything is smooth up to possible level four singularity. But one of the messages of the talk is that the string theory, the coset, still has the information of the locations of the NS5 brains. And we can see them using of the discrete brains. The, the discrete uh, positions of the NS5 brains. Yeah. So that's from the point of view of um, 
so probably you can't say that at all. It's mirrored out and it's actually non perturbative from the worksheet point of view. Okay, thanks. Okay, but like I said, uh, yeah, yours. So, so does this background have this cap that you had on your picture or is it only on some throat? Uh, Ge generically it's capped smoothly. Yeah. yeah. When so NS5 and F1 are both switched on, it's capped smoothly. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Just for curiosity, have you competed with energy, energy stress tanks associated with this matrix? Um, the, the certainly question certainly was more or less co yeah. collect, uh, yeah. related to what um, he was asking, which is the source of this, uh, of this matrix. Yeah, so, so yeah, the answer is yes. So you can compute it. Um, yeah, so, so you can check explicitly that this verifies the supergravity equation of motion. And uh, in fact, that's one way of deriving the dilaton, which is sourced because, um, you know, sigma model gives you G and B, but it's one loop to see the dilaton, or you can just solve the supergravity equations of motion. So, so yeah, there's some stress tensor associated with uh, B and the dilaton, which supports the metric. So you, you're, you're basically just solving this action e to the minus two phi r plus eight square plus grad phi square, right? Exactly. And yeah. yeah. Good. So uh, in when we do take the ADS three limit, however, this supergravity background simplifies dramatically, and uh, we get something which uh, you can eyeball the metric and, and see some kind of ADS three structure here. Uh, if you're familiar with these coordinates, so so you have the cos squared or ADC squared, sin squared or dy squared, and uh, and the rho squared is our ADS3. And then I have a finite size S3 with the theta squared and these things. And then you might say, okay, but I have these mixed terms here. And this was the answer to, I think, Igor's question of, how, or maybe it was uh, Ivo, what is the spectral flow of supergravity? It's precisely the mixing between this time and y variable with the S1s, which are the Cartan angles of my S3. So this, uh, this relation here, this mixing between these U1s is spectral flow and supergravity. And if you reabsorb that by a large coordinate transformation, then these backgrounds reduce to orbifolds of global ADS3 times S3. But in, if, if, you, if you don't undo that coordinate transformation, they are rotating versions of that background. And that's a physical thing because these are large coordinate transformations. They add charge and they're interpreted as different microstates. And uh, this is the answer to um, one, of, one of the questions over here. So in the ADS3, the dilaton is attracted to a constant. That's just the attractor mechanism for this, these microstates. Okay, good. So, so just not, one more question on yeah. the supergravity. So if you take that action, this e to the minus two phi or whatever, do you also have a, a solution with the horizon with the same charges? Yeah. Okay, so in principle, you could be adding those two solutions or? Yeah, uh, so that sort of depends on your perspective. There's no sort of, I would say there's no rigorous way to distinguish between how you should do if you want to count these things because when we're discussing a small family of solutions, if you say either I should add them or I should think of them as a subset, both prescriptions give you the correct version for the macroscopic entropy at, at leading order. So it's not something we can uh, we can say. What we can say is that these solutions are relatively atypical. So right. we're not going to get anywhere near questions of how to account for the full black hole entropy by studying these sure. solutions. But we try and get an idea of the stringy microstructure mm -hmm. underlying you know, but, solutions, which we. Can but you're study. saying. If we do just stick to the supergravity Lagrangian, this metric, this solution, and there is a solution with a horizon with the same asymptotic boundary conditions. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. yeah very good. So, uh, I mean, I mean, the, the perspective is also that the black hole solution to the same Lagrangian is singular, and we don't have a way in string theory of understanding how to resolve that singularity. Uh, so, so the. the that's why it's not so clear whether you should be adding these things or uh, with the black hole solution with even these three charges is singular in this case. Yeah, in the standard way, I mean, like inside the horizon. Inside the horizon, okay, okay, yeah. But, yeah. but but from the worldship point of view, I, if you give me such a solution, I still need to know 
what boundary condition I should put on a string wall shape at the singularity inside the horizon. Sure. Uh, so I need to know how yeah. that's resolved. So, uh, but, so yeah. But the All black hole solution outside the horizon and except for the usual curvature singularity is just the usual black hole solution. Sure. Yeah, this is like Reisman Nordstrom type uh, multi charge or three charge version of Reisman Nordstrom. Very good. So, uh, okay. So, I, as I said, we're not going to use too much of the holographic CFT, but just let me uh, write down at least the parameters because they will appear in the details on, on the slides when we're going through the calculations. So, it, as I said, there were different versions of spectral flow. So, there are three versions. One we just described in the supergravity. Corresponding to the supergravity spectral flow, there is a holographic CFT spectral flow which describes how you generate uh, the particular holographic CFT microstates, heavy states, which are dual to the supergravity solution. And this involves filling up Fermi C's to some particular filling level. And this can be done by spectral flow. And, and so there's a dictionary between the gravity spectral flow parameters, M and N, and the holographic CFT spectral flow parameters, which are sometimes described by alpha. And there's also, a, the typical parameterization of S and S bar. And uh, just <laughs> because we used a slightly more compact notation in our PRL, let me also put S plus and S minus just because it avoided me trying to uh, correct all the equations for different notations as I was grabbing them uh, from papers. So the details aren't important, but if anything becomes unclear, just let me know. These are all parameters describing spectral flow or angular momenta in bulk. Okay, so having written down these models and having this fabulous, powerful description of string dynamics in these heavy backgrounds, which by the way is a rare and valuable thing to have an exact description of string propagation in these heavy back reactive bound states very far from the vacuum of the full bulk theory. We can ask about correlators, observables, scattering. And so a generic, question in holographic setups is to study heavy light correlators. So generally light probes interacting with these heavy bound states can give us lots of information about the structure of the space time and in this case about black hole evaporation. And so when we talk about heavy light correlators, we are talking about having in some holographic CFT, two heavy background states, just like I was describing, and then some number of light insertions, which are considered as probes. And this uh, distinction between heavy and light for, does depend on the context in different papers, but for us, it's going to be the simplest version where heavy is an operator whose conformal dimension scales linearly with the central charge, and we'll be working at large C, large but finite central charge, large N, and the light operators have order one conformal dimension. And so here's a heavy light correlator where we have these two heavy states and some set of light insertions. And when we take the ADS3, ADS3 limit of these cosets, these endpoint functions correspond to just endpoint functions of light operators in the coset. The heavy background, the heavy states are already included in the definition of the world sheet CFT. Okay, so to access these observables, we analyze the string spectrum. And we focus primarily on massless states in both MS and S and the non one sectors. And remember, we had this uh, structure of the gauge model of SL2 and SU2. And so when we perform this gauging, we obtain additional terms in the BRST quantization of the model, which project out the states of the ungauged model that needs to be projected out. And what happens is the BRST charge involves uh, the uh, you know, both left and right, we have a gauge current, which is being gauged away. And we have its super partner, which I'm denoting by bold lambda. And each of these fermions, are, these are now world sheet fermions here. Each of them is the corresponding super partner to each of the component uh, currents that sit inside the gauge current. And so uh, we have a, a sort of souped up version of BRST where we have an extra DC system for the bosonic gauge current and an extra beta gamma system for the fermionic partner of the gauge current. And so we have you know, various tilted ghosts, which are bosonized in exactly the standard way 
let me know with uh, slight details of uh, the choice of weights according to the, the current beam uh, weight law. But okay, other than that, it's a beer just as we know it. And so when we build up vertex operators by first writing down the vertex operators of the ungauged model, and then imposing the BRSD constraints to get the physical vertex operators of the coset. And so we have central mass wave functions for uh, SL2R and SU2, and then the time and y directions. For simplicity in this talk, I'll switch off the y winding, and we won't consider any momentum or winding on the torus. And in SL2R, we'll also focus on the principal discrete series representations. And uh, so for D plus, for instance, we have uh, the n equals j state, and then we, we raise up in the usual way that uh, equal with the leading state. Oops. Okay, and so then for instance, before we apply the gauging, we have the Virasoro constraints for the ten plus two model, which looks like this. This constrains the uh, principal quantum numbers of SL2 and SU2 with uh, the energy and Y momentum. And then we have the bosonic null constraints, which come from uh, the J part of the BRSD that constrain the J3 quantum numbers in SL2, SU2, and again, energy and momentum. Okay, so just to summarize the procedure and, and course grain most of the details. So we will ignore the T4. And so before BRSD, there are naively eight polarizations of the six plus two dimensional space time according to where you put the fermion uh, for a supergravity state. Two combinations are removed by the G and lambda parts of the BRST procedure, and another two are BRST exact. And this leaves us with the four physical polarizations for each J, which we would have for a massless state in five plus one physical space time, or eight if we reinclude the T4. And you can derive some explicit expressions for these, which okay, I wrote down not fully explicitly, but just to give you a flavor. There are some various combinations of uh, klebsch gordon coefficients which were previously worked out for string theory in ADS3 tensors 3. And they sit in here. So here's a, a fermion polarized in the SL2. Here's one in SU2. And now we also have fermion polarizations in the extra time and y directions. And then there's some constraints on the relative uh, coefficients here which sit inside. And all this is saying is that there's some specific combination which is orthogonal to the gauging. And this is the physical state of the coset. Sorry, I, I, I just missed it. Which particular operator are you considering here physically in the space time? Uh, which so field? This is a massless NSNS sector state. Okay. Which I haven't, I, gravitons or B field. Or, okay. Or, or, yeah, yeah. yeah. NSNS uh, or, or gelatin. Yeah. yeah. Thanks. So, so. Good, so, so uh, yeah, I'm focusing just on supergravity sector for simplicity, and this was this was an SMS. Okay, so this, this is just showing you a sketch of how the spectrum is derived. Yeah, they, they're all fermions, uh, world chief fermions here. And so no, I was wondering uh, what are they, do, do they do this gravity W, remind me on the graviton and this, uh, and yeah. so on. So I'm working chirally, so this is just a left moving sector. Okay. Let's say a graviton. And okay. so I have a, just, I'm working the minus one picture, so I have. Uh, okay, it's just just only the chiral, so you have to double, okay. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, so similarly for the Romanovan sector, it's uh, like type two by, like type two B or type two A, as you know it, but imagine doing the analog of type two theory in 10 plus two dimensions. So you start with a 64 component spinner of O102. You impose the analog of the GSO projection to start with, which cuts down half the degrees of freedom. And then you impose the BRST constraints, which cuts down by a further F factor of four, leaving the eight physical polarizations for a nine plus one massless particle. And we use, in this case, the minus one half plus one half picture for the bar phi, bar phi tilde ghost where this bar phi tilde is uh, the same thing you know as uh, bosonization of super ghosts, but applied to these spinner ghosts for null gauging. And so uh, the ansatz takes the form of the center of mass wave function times a general spin field with some 
the sum of a coefficients to allow for an appropriately general linear combination. And then we make the same procedure of imposing that you get the physical states orthogonal to the gradient. So I won't write down the details here because it's a bit more messy, but hopefully you have an idea of uh, how the procedure goes. Okay, and so then there's one more thing we need before we can discuss holographic correlators, which is that so far we've been discussing the vertex operators in the basis in which the Cartan currents are diagonalized. This is often called the M basis uh, in, in ADS3, it's on the SI2 in particular. But to study ADS3 holography, we need to introduce a, an auxiliary complex label X and pass to the conjugate X basis where this X corresponds to the local coordinate of the holographic CFD. And uh, so it, because we have these gauge models, one needs a little bit of care to identify the correct X coordinate. We need to take the ADS3 limit and then go to the asymptotic of that. And so the first step is to make a systematic large RY expansion of the models. And to identify the modes, we choose a particular gauge by fixing the SL2R time and angular direction upstairs. And when we do so, the time and Y directions of the uh, pre-gauged model parameterize the asymptotic boundary of the physical ADS3, which is, which is now the asymptotic from this limit. So then we identify these modes, these chiral combinations of energy and momentum in ADS3, and we interpret these as the asymptotic mode labels of, uh, of the operators. And this gives us our definition. Uh, what do you the, mean, uh, time and angular direction? Because, uh, but, uh, you know, not to have the mixing uh, angular uh, uh, with, uh, with a phi. So it, you have asymptotically at the S and not uh, at the sort of asymptotically rotating. We, we do have asymptotically rotating ADS still, yeah. 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 But, uh, but then it, it's sort of a choice of frame at infinity whether you want to co-rotate, okay? So uh, regardless of your choice of that, uh, we still need to identify what is the ADS3 component of, uh, of that. So this gives us this identification of the modes and then this tells us how we should pass to the appropriate X basis for the gauge models. And this gives us um, a way of combining these modes uh, MY here that you see inside the uh, exponentials of T and Y with this X coordinate appropriate to the models to define the, this uh, operator. And this, you should think of this as um, an operator which is corresponding to some particular point in the boundary of ADS3, ADS3 where this uh, string is going to be sent in from. And, and this is, it's a little bit like. ADS3 holographic correlators, but for strings. Okay, so this is this is kind of a souped-up version of the Malleson and Guri uh, series. Okay, how am I doing? I'm at 60 minutes, so maybe I'll skip a little bit close quickly through the some of these more technical slides. But uh, okay, I shouldn't need more than 10, 15 minutes, depending on your question. Okay, good. So uh, having invested the work in the spectrum and the identification of the X coordinates, we now have everything we need to compute heavy light correlators. And from this, we get a surprising amount of non-trivial physics for heavy light, light, heavy correlators in particular, and also more general correlators with light insertions. And a lot of this physics flows from the gauge constraints of the model. So I showed you this, uh, Null constraint, the bosonic null constraint from uh, the, the curly J component of BRST. The, everything simplifies slightly in this ADS3 limit, so it takes this form. But there's one basic important physics of fractionation, which is easily readable from this equation. This is factors of K here. So if you solve these equations, there are two equations here. If you solve them for K, for, solve them for MY, excuse me, then there's a one over K in front of what you're solving for. So this tells you that the chiral momenta along the Y circle are fractionated in units of one over K. Okay, and that's as it should be, but there is a constraint from overall momentum quantization on the Y circle that the momentum, so the difference of the chiral momenta is an integer. Okay, so this is a standard thing of momentum fractionation. And this implies that local operators are built 
only out of a subset of modes, those modes which satisfy some particular condition modulo k. Okay, and so that's an important thing which uh, will will lead to very non-trivial correlators. So let's do this example. So I, I showed you a particular simple chiral primary of the holographic CFT, and I said I would use it later. So now, now is when I'm going to use it. So it turns out this chiral primary is dual to some particular Ramon-Ramon supergravity state. And uh, we can compute now its two-point function in the cosets. And all the non-trivial physics for this operator comes from the gauge constraints. So schematically, we take our operators where we've introduced this x coordinate, and we write down the coset two-point function. So it involves these, uh, you know, an x coordinate for uh, operator one and operator two, and we've included both left and right moving sectors here. And then we have some coset correlator which needs to be computed, but for these light operators, it's particularly simple. So let's make it more specific. Let's consider a discrete series representation. Uh, we have some particular relations for the quantum numbers such that it's dual to some particular chiral primary state of the holographic CFT. And uh, so in particular, the SU2 uh, Cartan quantum numbers are minus the, the weight, so it's an anti-chiral primary, just for conventional reasons. And then we have some particular uh, discrete series set of modes. So for h equals a half, we get these bosonic null constraints. And so again, we have a mod k condition, which is this thing down here. And the correlated contributions are essentially trivial for this uh, particular choice of simple things. So if I suppress the z dependence and I suppress all the ghosts and super ghosts and let them be taken care of in the background, at the end of the day, it boils down to this nice expression, which is relatively compact, but it's still non-trivial because here we are summing over not just non-negative integers and an n bar according to the content of this representation, but only those which satisfy the mod k condition. Question. Sorry, so this is still a world sheet computation? Yes. And so the y, how is it related to the v you had on the previous slide? Uh, it's a slight mix of notation. So, uh, so y is our notation for the Ramon Ramon state. So y is really this O. Okay. Um, so it's just a copy paste thing. And then V is uh, the corresponding world sheet a vertex operator before I had this mm -hmm. X dependence that I introduced. Uh, and in the next slide, you have integrated over the Z already? Uh, no, the Z dependence is there in the background. There's some one over Z12 to some power. Oh, you just I'm, haven't written it. I'm suppressing okay. it because it's not the important part of the physics. Yeah, thanks. I wasn't paying attention, but are you working on in the Euclidean CFT or in the um, Minkowskian CFT? Minkowskian. So this is x plus and x minus, but this x and x uh, plus. Well, no, this x is, uh, well, I, I should have asked for clarification. So this x is just an auxiliary complex label. Oh. And it, cor from the world sheet point of view, but it corresponds to the local coordinate in the boundary CFT in a Euclidean. Uh, yeah, so, so your your intuition was correct that there's maybe some Euclidianization going on here. So yeah, we've taken the holographic CFT two, we've Euclidianized the boundary, made complex coordinates for that boundary, and that's this x coordinate, which is just something auxiliary from the world sheet. Yeah. Oh, uh, good. So then, it, you know, this this is some expression. Okay, great. We computed the world sheet two point function. And so we can ask, now we did something in ADS3 string theory, what's the corresponding CFT2 correlator? And is there any help you might be able to match these things? Sorry, but to get the world sheet correlator, you need to do the Z integral, right? So here, I, it's, here, well, it, it's a two-point function, so. Um, okay, it, so. You... So in principle, yes, but. Uh, it's not going to, I mean, it might give me some more vulnerabilization. But, but, but the, the this amplitude with just two operators is subtle because you haven't fixed the PSL2C completely. No, it's just an, an, on the sphere. If you, I mean, there are ways to deal with it, but if you, there's a, there's a subtlety there. Mm -hmm. uh,
No, but this is a string correlator. These are vertex operators on the string. There was a Z on the previous slide that is not written here. Yeah, um, yeah, he's right. There is a Z there. Um, I don't remember now. So, I mean, there was a paper by Harold Urban and Juan and Dimitri that dealt with this problem in flat space string theory. Mm -hmm. But I would imagine that you need to do something like that uh, to, because the issue with the PSL2C. Yeah, anyway, yeah, so I if I were to complete this to a full computation, I would probably need to think about that subtlety, but we haven't actually okay. looked into that subtlety because for our purposes, the, the Z dependence isn't the focus somehow, it's the X dependence. Okay, so yeah. as a functional can, dependent on X. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So it's the, it's the, the functional dependence on X is the thing which we can match mm -hmm. holographically. So. so, and just so you have these X and X bar being the boundary CFT coordinates in the geometry that you wrote down, what is the topology of the boundary of ADS3? Is it a cylinder or a sphere? Uh, so it, it, in this, uh, well, for the applications we're doing, it's a cylinder. It's a cylinder. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's important there because um, it, there are differences in terms of um, what operators you can, you know, th so there's a whole relation to the, Gabriel and collaborators uh, uh, work where that's very Euclidean. But here we're interested in the Lorentzian uh, yeah. space time and, and the Lorentzian. Yeah, Lorentzian. I guess the reason I'm asking because in this Malda Sena Oguri sort of papers from the 2000s, I think implicitly this X and X bar was parameterizing a sphere. So I'm just worried that the transformation you're doing to go from these mode numbers to the X mm -hmm. might have some dependence on the topology of the boundary. Um, that's an interesting well, question. Because yeah, there they were imagining um, Euclidean H three as being yeah, the bulk, and yeah, yeah. So yeah, I mean, I didn't think this was something that was going to depend sensitively on that. So so that you know, there's a set of things which one can continue back and forth between H three plus and the uh, Lorentzian. Uh, yeah, SSM. I guess if you're in the OPE limit, like X is close to one or something, then for it probably doesn't matter, but yeah. Anyway. Yeah, thanks. I mean, we haven't looked in too much into these subtleties, but uh, but for now, let me focus on the X dependence and show you this uh, beautiful agreement one can derive. So here's a, a correlator which looks very different a priori, which was derived in two separate ways uh, before us, a few years before us. I don't, haven't given the reference, but it's uh, Galliani, Moscato, uh, Giusto Russo, I think. Or some com some subset of them. Just the Moscato Russo, I think, 2016 or so. And they studied just the supergravity backgrounds. The, they didn't have the world sheet uh, theory available, but you can compute the corresponding heavy light correlated in supergravity and separately in holographic CFT. And they had noticed agreement, which is already something quite surprising because it's a four point function. Four point functions are generally renormalized, so there's a priori no guarantee. But there was an observation made that this has exactly the same expression in supergravity and holographic CFT for some subset of cases that, that they were able to study. So this uh, correlator is for the BPS free charge backgrounds, so not non-BPS. But if you manipulate this expression and uh, you know, add and subtract some things and expand the denominators, we showed that it's actually identical to the world sheet correlator. So that's quite a nice thing because instead of now just comparing isolated points of supergraphs and holographic CFT, we have the exact amount of time correlator and the expression agrees beautifully. And uh, so that's a nice thing. And, and it also allows us to generalize quite a bit because this previous work could only study the CFT, the holographic CFT in some special cases of S hat where S hat is the residue of S mod P, so it's K. So there's some mod K physics in the background of all of this. And there's some simplification in the holographic CFT for these values. But now we have the result exactly in alpha prime and for all values of S hat. So you say the S and K are related to the three charges somehow? Is that yeah, right? So, uh, so S is the key parameter that adds the third charge. S is a spectral flow, chiral spectral flow in the holographic CFT. K is an all befalling parameter. So if you switch on K but set S to zero, you remain in the three charge family, but you uh, get solutions with 
progressively lower angular momentum, so they're closer and closer to typical microstates. So cranking k large gets us towards typical, more typical microstates, and cranking s large adds more and more momentum, but it doesn't get us any closer to typicality. So I, I was just uh, asking about so you had q1, q5, and p, yeah, and it, essentially very roughly those are the ones parameters that are being encoded in s and k. No, 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 they're independent. Well, let me say more carefully. N1 and N5 are independent of S and K. Okay. NP depends on S, K, N1, N5 in some particular way. So, so why do we have two labels now? So should, didn't the state only have three charges? Well, yes, there are three conserved charges, but then there are many microstates. Uh -huh. and so the K is labeling different types of microstates for the same charges. Okay. So how is the supergravity calculation done of this correlator? Are you solving some wave equation on the background? Exactly. So the supergravity, since the answer depends on S, the supergravity background must know about S, right? Sure, absolutely. Yeah, that's important. So all the, the, this mixing between ADS3 times S3, which involves the rotation, is controlled by S. Okay, so but a very that, different supergravity background. I see. <laughs> Just to understand. Heavy light. <laughs> There is not one heavy, one light. <laughs> I mean, you can have scalar uh, operators and uh, vectorial, tensorial. So here it seems we are considering scalar operators, or at least the part which is independent uh, on the tensorial structure of, uh, of the operator. Is this? Uh... Do you, are you asking what I mean by heavy and light? Uh, no, uh, about uh, the, sp the spin of this heavy and light. I mean, because they have, a, if you take a heavy light, okay, it is a, a connected as far as I understand with a dimension. But then you have all the spinorial structure, the spin, no, spinorial, tensorial structure of, of the operators. I'm not sure I really understand the question. So, uh, which operator? Conformal operators. So, I'm, uh, I still don't understand the question. So I, I have some particular, uh, are you asking the world sheet or the holographic? No, no, okay, from CFT. Holographic CFT. CF, you have taken CFT. Yeah. Usually you have, uh, there are, <laughs> if you take, uh, for example, the, the free CFT, you have a, uh, what is called a higher, sp higher spin uh, scale, uh, phi, multiple derivative, uh, Multiple derivative phi. This is a still uh, operator, but it is a, a tensorial structure, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. which is reflected in the correlators. Okay. Uh, okay. This, what are you writing, is a scalar color, uh, correlator. So, well, in uh, in yeah, in, in a holographic CFT, it's a scalar. Yes. Yeah. It's uh, h equals h bar equals one half. Yeah, we can talk later. Maybe I'm not fully understanding. Sorry, just to dwell on, because this seems like an important, so, and the CFT, the dual CFT computation, you're saying there's also an independent calculation from there for this? Yeah, so there are, there are three ways to obtain this correlator. Okay. Yeah, so so in the CFT, I showed you this particular fermion bilinear, yeah. which is this chiral primary, so mm -hmm. h, equals, h equals h bar equals one half. So it's just elementary fermions, single trace, so, so untwisted, Single trace, some of the, all the copies, some specific light operator in the mm -hmm. holographic CFT. And then I have some specific background states which involve Fermi C's so, of the same elementary fermions. So and so then there's some free field computation. That so you're using the fact that this correlator is protected somehow because the orbifold CFT corresponds to k equals one, right? But here the, you have a yeah. general k. Yeah, so it's slightly different. I'm, what? I'm okay, sorry. proving for you that it's protected by case by case analysis. Because okay. th this was not, th there was a priori, there was no non renormalization theorem which would tell us that this is actually uh -huh. protected. Uh -huh. So I'm observing at this point in the talk that uh, this correlator, by explicit case by case, happens to be protected. Yeah, so that there are non renormalization functions for two non renormalization theorems for two and three point functions in the vacuum, but from the point of view of the vacuum, this is a four-point function. Right, right. So right. it has no a priori guarantee to be protected. Oh, that's and interesting. Yet, uh, it's accident, from, from this point of view of the talk, 
uh, this stage in the story, it's accidentally protected. And you so just that, computed it in the at the at the orbifold point, and you're just observing that it's independent of the boundary CFT moduli space. Yeah. Even though you are working with L string, much much less than the curvature scale. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. So this uh, this was something which is not completely unanticipated because, like I said, this has been it had been observed two years before in supergravity in orbifold CFT, but it wasn't known whether there was some renormalization up and down to these type things. But now we have exact enough to find that there's a constant uh, cross modulus solution. So uh, so good, and that's. That's already progress, that's, that's a nice thing. But uh, we can generalize it quite a bit further because with the cosets, we can do not just the BPS backgrounds, but also the non-BPS backgrounds. And there, there's even less reason to think it will be protected because the states aren't BPS. And yet, uh, surprisingly, there are some matches that you can even uh, observe in the non-BPS backgrounds. But we'll get there. Let me not get too far ahead uh, in real time. Okay, so let me not go through the details, but I showed you one express example with a particular light operator. By observing the structure of the world sheet, so let me come back to the world sheet now, then we can uh, impose this restricted sum mod k, so we can sort of unpack the, the, mod the modulo k sum into an unrestricted sum over the kth roots of this label x. And this gives us some nice formula. And this is quite suggestive when we have this formula because we see the kth roots of the insertion point coming out, which is suggestive of some kind of covering space uh, coming into the story. And this invites a comparison with the holographic CFT. And you can also generalize this readily to generic massless insertions. And okay, how do we do that? Well, we can write, uh, you know, we can expand back this my as x del by dx plus h. We can write down some analogous thing for the m label, so the j3 of the upstairs for this uh, variable u. And so the intuition is that this u is related to the pre gauged SL2. To obtain uk equals x, we get some particular numbers for b time b third bar. And this gives us some nice way of writing this x basis world sheet operator in terms of k roots of x. Okay, and so then world sheet correlators with these generic massless insertions of just two point functions, HLLH, take this surprisingly simple form involving sums over roots of the k, uh, k roots of the insertion points. So a priori, this is a prediction for the holographic CFT at strong coupling. We, we don't have any non renormalization theorem a priori. But we've already seen, seen one example where case by case it happened to be protected. And actually, we had a look in the literature for any other heavy light light heavy correlators that people had already computed. And any of them we were able to check explicitly, they also match the holographic CFT. So there's some suggestion of some more general non renormalization going on here. And separately, we can use this map to conjecture a formula for world sheet correlators with n massless insertions using exactly this map to the covering space. And so this is some proposal for the world sheet correlator with two uh, you know, heavy backgrounds defining the coset and then some generic uh, n massless insertions. Now, okay, when we think about holography, we wouldn't expect any agreement beyond, let's say, three light insertion, so that's a five point function. Well, beyond that, we expect some normalization, I would say. But with three, there's at least something to have a look. So we actually looked at a five point function with three light insertions and the two heavy states, and it happens to be, again, protected. And as far as we have any idea, this remarkable agreement must be due to the relatively special nature of these heavy background states. Okay. so. Before I run out of time, let me just mention one corollary that we can do, which is to study the unitary analog of Hawking radiation from the states. So I've uh, suppressed the linear dilaton intermediate region because this was a slide taken from the D1D5 talk where it's not there. But uh, in the CFT, in the holographic CFT, there's a process which describes Hawking radiation in the bulk. 
So this is where some left mover and right mover join together with some particular vertex operator, which allows uh, degrees of freedom to be emitted from the CFT into the ambient space time. And in AVS, the dual of that is some graviton or some Hawking particle, which was emitted by a black hole, which uh, climbs up the ADS3 ADS, uh, throat and has some amplitude to escape into the, uh, the outside asymptotic region. And we can take a limit of these two point functions that I just described, where we take one of the light operators and push it into the definition of the heavy state. And this gives us a one point matrix uh, amplitude for uh, the, the background to spontaneously emit the particle in some unitary way. And like this, we can derive, rederive what was already known to be the amplitude for the unitary analog of Hawking radiation from these backgrounds. And this is another case where agreement had already been observed between supergravity and holographic CFT. And again, we fill in with the exact alpha primes uh, computation, finding the exact agreement. And the nice thing about this is the background was non-BPS. So this is really quite special behavior. Sorry, could, okay. could you explain uh, this A of X quantity? Just yeah, it's, it's uh, going a bit quick. So this is the amplitude for emission of a particle from the band state. What is X? So X is again, uh, this uh, coordinate that describes, the, so in this case now there's only one cross ratio, well, there's only one cross ratio, but it's the um, locate, it's the X variable corresponding to the single light operator in this amplitude. So now I have like heavy state one, light operator and heavy state two. But that doesn't have a cross ratio in it, right? If it's a three point function. So, so it's the, it's what was the cross, uh, I said cross ratio, speaking to, to, it's what was the cross ratio uh, of the four point function before we then put the limit. Uh, so you're isolating like one term in the OP expansion of that four point function or? What? Yeah, yeah, we're, we're pushing one of the light operators to the origin basically. Okay. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, and, and what do you mean by unitary analog of Hawking radiation? What, what so uh, good, there's a whole story there, but let me give you the short version. Uh, so these backgrounds have uh, their smooth supergravity solutions and they, uh, the non-BPS ones have a mechanism by which they spontaneously emit particles from an ergo region in the space time. And so it's an amplified version of Hawking radiation in the sense that uh, in the holographic CFT, it's exactly the same microscopic procedure described by the same vertex operator, which describes Hawking radiation from thermal states. But here now we have relatively special atypical states, which if you apply the same vertex operator, you get an amplified amplitude for emission. But microscopically it's the exactly the same process. It's just unitary emission from less typical microstates, which have a, a particular spectrum of frequencies. So this delta function up top is imposing the particular frequencies that the background wants to emit in. And, uh, and so, okay, this, uh, this can be translated into some um, rate of emission. Okay, good. So I don't have time to tell you about D-brains, uh, but okay, let me, let me just say very quickly in words that, uh, so th this is basically the end of the story for the, the recent work. Let me just flash a few slides about um, the less recent work and conclude. So uh, there's a whole other set of things, one, questions one can ask about where are the NS5 brains in the background and which observables are sensitive to them. And since D brains, so fundamental strings cannot resolve the location of the NS5 brains because the distances between the five brains is subscript substring. So in alpha prime union, this is one over the square root of N5. N5 is large, so it's way substring, but it's larger than the Planck scale. And D brains can probe all the way down to the Planck scale. So if we think about D brain probes, we can potentially resolve the NS5 brain structure. So and because we have a Western mean width model, there's a lot of group theory technology that we can use to study brain world volumes in the semi-classical analysis and also compute the world volume flux and check the DVI and so on. So I won't go into it because I'm out of time, but there's a paper we wrote in 2019 and I'm happy to discuss uh, over the break. 
And the main point is that for the gauging, you know, in the gauge models, we might be lucky that some brain is already extended in the gauge direction, in which case it's physical downstairs. But more typically, we may have to smear the brain along the gauge orbit so that we can get a physical brain downstairs. So that's the main physics. And then you find a rich spectrum of brains which are sensitive to these NS5 brain locations. So I've plotted uh, the locations of these NS5 brains as one five brain compactified on other directions located at a point in these directions I'm plotting. And there are various, in this case, D1 brains that stretch between the NS5 brains. And if you study the world volume flux, you can see that it's sensitive to which NS5 brain the D1 is ending on. So there's a whole story there, uh, but okay, I'm out of time, so let me not uh, go into it. And we can also uh, generalize the whole story to a larger class of backgrounds corresponding to the general family of two charge black hole microstates. Generically, these are not cosets, but you can still do a lot. And in particular, one can construct elliptically deformed backgrounds and uh, study lots of interesting things. So uh, let me summarize. We've constructed and studied models, uh, families of worship models that describe black hole microstates. These models capture physics beyond the supergravity approximation. We can compute correlators in these models. And these developments offer the tantalizing prospect of understanding the whole black hole Hilbert space, including its most entropic parts. So I'll leave it there. Thank you. So we are almost out of time. So if there are urgent questions, we can ask now. But if not, we will have a discussion later. Uh, actually, I have just. I'm still trying to understand this quantity A of X. So I understood that if you glue back in the flat space region, your CFT, you know, is now sort of glued to flat space. So you can have operator of the CFT leak out into the flat space region. So what exactly is this A of X computing uh, in that process? So probably something we should do in the break because okay. we need a few lines of algebra, but, um, but in, in brief, these, uh, these exponents, are, so the delta function is, computing this, you know, imposing the spectrum of allowed frequencies. And these exponents of X can be translated into an emission rate. But to, to see that you need a few steps because there's a process microscopically that you can see there's a kind of Bose enhancement mechanism whereby uh, as you emit particles, there's some, it's kind of an, ex, you know, an enhancement mechanism, which means that there's an exponential growing yeah. rate and then the, the coefficient of that is something you can derive from. Yeah, I, I was just asking about the left hand side. What's the definition of A of X? Ah, uh, well, it's it's uh, coming from the limit of this Hilbert function. So, it, Sorry. yeah, what's it, the definition of it, A of X? It's a world sheet amplitude in which we took one of the um, one of the light operators, so, so we want to compute, instead of a two-point function, we want to compute a matrix element where the heavy states are different. One of them contains, uh, depending on whether you think about absorption and emission, let's think about emission in the simplest case where you put the one of the light operators and fuse it with the heavy band, the, one of the heavy states. I see. So then it, the heavy states are different. With by, a small, by a light particle. By a light particle, and then uh -huh. precisely that light particle, you want to let it I see. Emitted. I see. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so we can thank David again.